folks, if you're just joining us, this is the SFUSD Town Hall on the Budget Balancing Plan. And you'll see on the screen there uh, information on how to access our interpretation and translation in Spanish and in Chinese. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Interpreters, if you would like to, you may make the announcement about interpretation in the language that you're supporting. Sure. Buenas noches a todos. El Distrito Unificado Escolar de San Francisco ofrece interpretación gratuita al español. Si usted necesita interpretación al español, por favor marque el número que aparece en la pantalla. Ese es el número 319. 382-9676. Luego va a entrar la clave 665-996-976, tecla numeral. Gracias. Acajo. San Francisco, no, que es que manco, vida, hay que con conto, va a que chine como, soy coleseo, cuando va a chine como, sin dar de mato, ya, se, va, se, va, se. 3-3-2-1-7. Thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for being here and supporting our families this evening and our members of the community who want to be able to access this. Um, and uh, Miranda, are you with me? Yes. Um, hi, welcome to the SFPUSD Budget Balancing Community Town Hall. My name is Miranda Martin. I am the interim executive director at a nonprofit called Parents for Public Schools of San Francisco. And we've worked to support public school families in San Francisco for over 20 years. And part of our work has always been supporting families in understanding and engaging with SFUSD and school site budget process. Um, and I'll be one of the moderators tonight at this town hall. Thank you, and I'll be your other moderator this evening. I'm Michelle Jacques Menegas, and I am the coordinator for the Parent Advisory Council to the San Francisco Board of Education, also known as the PAC. Uh, I'm also a for former PAC member, and the PAC's role is to provide parent perspective to the board in their policy decisions, um, and we provide monthly reports at board meetings featuring issues of importance to parents, families and students. More information can be found at sfusd.edu slash PAC. So again, welcome everyone if you're just joining us, whether it's through Facebook Live or through the district's webinar this evening. And Miranda is going to give us a few points on how tonight's going to work. Yes, so for those of you on Zoom, Chat will not be available for this event, but the Q&A feature is available, and we encourage you to submit any questions for the panelists using this feature. And you can also use this to let us know if you're experiencing any technical challenges, and we'll try to support you, including if you're having trouble accessing interpretation. For those on Facebook, you can submit your questions via the online survey, um, and we will be monitoring new responses during this event. And actually, we've got a slide that shows how to access the online survey. So maybe if we could move to the next slide, um, and I will also put that in the chat. Um, so there's a QR code for the survey there and also a short URL that you can use to access it. And then I'll put that into the chat as well. Great. Thank you, Miranda. And I see that we are having a little trouble with the Facebook Live, um, but we're working on it. And we hope to get that up as soon as possible. Thank you, Hong Mei. Um, so if you have questions uh, that you don't hear reflected or answered during this event, um, you are welcome to email them to me at pac at sfusd.edu. We will do our best to answer them or direct you to the right source. Um, we will also use the questions generated tonight um, in the Q&A and those in the survey and any that we received via email to update the FAQ that's on the district's budget balancing page. 
um, because chances are your question is also someone else's question. And one of the reasons that we do it via the district's website is that it's supported in multiple languages. Great. So tonight we have a panel of district leaders who are deeply engaged in the budget balancing process. Um, our panelists include Anne Marie Gordon, who's the executive director of budget services for SFUSD. We also have Megan Wallace, who is the chief financial officer of SFUSD. We have Board of Education Commissioner Jenny Lamb, who is chair of the Budget and Business Services Committee. And we also have Myung Lee, who is Deputy Superintendent of Policy and Operations for SFUSD. And our agenda this evening will be first a presentation about the district's current budget situation, along with information about the proposals for budget balancing. And then we'll have time reserved for answering questions submitted to panelists through the Q&A and the survey that was recently released. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to just acknowledge that um, this is a really difficult subject, both because it's very complex and also because it's hard. Um, we're gonna be faced with some difficult decisions this year. Um, and we also admit that the deadline uh, set by the state uh, to turn in our budget balancing plan means that there's not really been enough time to do deep engagement with our communities before we have to turn that plan in. And we know that's not ideal. Um, the intent of this event is to provide information on what we do know and where we are in the process um, in as clear and comprehensible a way as possible. Um, and also to create a structure and a system that we can build on as we go forward um, with the different phases of budgeting and decision making, not only this year, but beyond. Um, and there will be other times and opportunities to both get more information and to be able to provide input um, as we go through the year. Uh, one way to provide that input now is through the survey um, that Miranda mentioned and you see the, the QR code there on the screen. Um, please, please complete it. Um, and please also share it out with your school communities, uh, with your parenting networks um, so that we can hear from as many SFUSD community members as possible. Um, and we understand that for most families, the real question is, how is this gonna affect my kid, <laughs> their school, their classroom, their education? Um, and for this, we highly encourage folks to get involved with their school site council at their kid's school. Um, the school site council or SSC is the body that actually makes the decisions about budgeting and the plan for educating kids at the school site level. Um, and those meetings are open to everyone. Um, so check with your school principal or leadership um, to find out more information. Um, and again, you're always welcome to email me at pac at sfusd.edu with questions and support. And now to get us started, I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Lamb. Thank you so much, Michelle. Good evening to our SFUSD uh, uh, community. Uh, first, I just want to also acknowledge and thank Miranda, Parents of Public Schools, and Michelle with our parent PAC. Without them, we would not be able to have the engagement, the authenticity of um, the genuine uh, engagement of our families, which is so important um, as we move through this process and um, the budgeting and balancing plan. Uh, as Michelle opened up with, uh, this is a very tough process for us to have to um, endure uh, as a district, but a critical one, and that we must um, make some tough decisions um, and more importantly, inform and educate our school communities, our parents, our students about uh, what, is, uh, what is before us and um, how did we get here and what are some of the challenges facing our, our budget. So for tonight's meeting, our goals and objectives is, again, around to address the challenges and understanding uh, where we are with the budget um, as a district. What's the proposed budget balancing plan for the next fiscal year, which begins on July 1, 2022 through 23, as well as the following year, fiscal year 2023 to 24? A key piece in many of the questions that we've had a series of, of meetings throughout this fall is, um, you know, what are the potential impacts of 
the uh, budgets uh, will have on our students and schools. What is it going to look like? What is it going to feel like? And then we also want to be able to create a uh, space on how we can involve um, schools, school communities, um, as we go through the district's budget development process beyond the December 14th deadline, which we have to submit to the California Department of Education. We'll also have our uh, open, uh, we'll have a question and answer portion of this evening, as well as, uh, which has already been mentioned, the um, launch of our community input survey. Next slide, please. This one wanted to give um, the community an overview of the budget um, balancing plan and information sessions we've had throughout this fall, um, as well as upcoming decisions in that overall timeline. So starting in early November, we've held consistently um, either full budget, I'm sorry, board meetings, regular uh, scheduled board meetings, as well as the budget and business services committee where we've been having a progression of presentations, discussions, iteration of this balancing plan. So today we are in the phase two of really specific discussions, feedback in iteration as we move forward on the budget town hall. Tomorrow, we, if you want to join us again, we are having our next budget and business services, which will be a continuation of uh, from the November 17th um, meeting as well as taking input from uh, tonight's discussion, followed by December 7th, so the committee as a whole um, will continue to have further um, dialogue uh, between staff and board members and our superintendent and community. And then finally, phase three is the vote and adopt the budget balancing plan for December 14th, as we must submit to the California Department of Education by December 15th to be um, in compliance and fulfillment of uh, demonstrating um, the recognition of the fiscal sustainability plans we need to have in place. So next slide, please. This also gives an overview of um, beyond December and our submission to the budget balancing plan, an overview of the remaining 21-22 budget cycle, as well as the local, um, the LCAP overview. And that's really important because the LCAP really also is a, a core of how we wrap our, um, our vision and our priorities and goals of what we're meeting in our student outcomes and success um, and how that budget really reflects those priorities. So you'll see through the uh, double red dotted line is where we're at today. And this will, um, in the coming weeks, in the next two weeks, we will close um, this initial phase of the budget balancing plan. However, um, as soon as we come back from winter break in January, uh, we launch right into um, budget planning, uh, the regular cycle from January through March, um, as well as um, schools will also start getting their budgets. Thank you. I believe I will turn it over to staff around providing overview of our current fiscal. Great, thank you, Commissioner Lamb. Um, good evening, I'm Megan Wallace, the Chief Financial Officer for SFUSD. Um, and you know, in terms of the question of why are we all here this evening, um, I just wanna start with the basics of the fact that the district is required to prepare a balanced operating budget each year that also includes um, two fiscal years worth of multi-year projections. And what we've seen over time is that um, the district's expenditures have been growing at a faster pace than our revenue. Um, the primary source of funds that we receive um, as a district from the state is called the local control funding formula. Um, and it, over time, it just has not kept up with our expenditures. Um, and this chart helps illustrate uh, the deficit that we have been operating under as a district. Um, the blue line represents the revenues that we receive. Um, the yellow line represents our expenditures and the red line is the combination of our revenues and fund balance. Um, so 
in recent history, we've been spending down that fund balance. When you see that the yellow line creeps up over time um, to catch up to our revenues and fund balance. Um, and in this past fiscal year, um, last year as well in the current year, we were able to close operating deficits using one-time federal and state funding. Um, however, looking ahead to fiscal years 2022, 23, and beyond, we see that we as a district continue to face a structural deficit that we have to work to resolve. Um, this chart just helps illustrate uh, some of the variants between our revenues and expenses. Looking back um, in the history of the local control funding formula, you can see that the green bars represents our revenues and more or less is in line with our expenditures. But over time, uh, you can see that our expenses um, are out, outpacing our revenues um, at, and, and that that variance is getting larger over time. And so that by definition is a structural deficit where we are uh, spending more than we're bringing in. So the key takeaways in terms of our budget that I hope you all have from this meeting tonight um, are that first of all, we are facing a structural budget deficit. Um, the combination of state, local and federal funding all support our operations but we are projected to spend more than we receive in all of those areas. And again, we have been relying on one-time uh, federal as well as state dollars to help us balance. Um, however, we have to uh, fix the structural deficit moving forward. Um, as a result of the challenges we've been facing as a district, um, the California State Superintendent of Public Instruction assigned a fiscal expert, Elliot Duchon, to help uh, um, our district look at opportunities for budget reductions, reduce our expenditures, and bring them in line uh, with the funds that we're projected to receive, and just to advise us on other district financial issues. But the most immediate need that we're all facing, and as Commissioner Lamb highlighted, is the requirement to submit a budget balancing plan by December 15th. So we are facing um, some immediate urgency to identify that plan. But as mentioned at the beginning, we do hope that the conversations that we begin here this evening will continue on for years to come as we all become uh, more comfortable talking about the district's budget and learning to work as a community to identify our priorities and make sure that we're investing um, in our students to help them reach their highest potential. So when it comes to our budget balancing, um, it's important to talk about the process and rationale um, that go into the plan that has been pre presented by staff. And I'm gonna take a little bit of time to walk you through that. So to begin, uh, the district staff work to identify a process overall, um, reviewing our budget, identifying ways to understand its structure um, and discuss how we wanted to go about um, budget reductions. We laid out a project timeline, all with the focus of having a budget balancing plan by this December. And then we look to develop a vision. So what do we want out of a balanced budget? Is it simply enough to have the numbers line up or are we going to look for ways um, to make sure that we're investing um, in our core functions and the, our highest priority programs that achieve um, positive outcomes for our students. Um, and then once we identify that vision, we've been working as a team to analyze our budget, compile and evaluate our costs, look for that evidence of effectiveness of different programs, um, and look across um, different programs, services, and activities uh, within our budget and do comparative analysis, um, both internally between our programs and looking externally um, at other uh, districts in California. Um, and then where we are today is reviewing proposal options um, that we have developed as a result of that work, looking for that cost savings and discussing and exploring the impacts um, across um, our community. Um, and what we are hoping for uh, it come December 14th is that the package that we've been developed um, will ultimately be approved and we can move our decisions forward 
to the California Department of Education. Part of this process and, and the evaluation uh, phase of developing our recommendation um, is applying a series of lenses. You're trying to think about what are the different ways that we want to look at the investments that we make as a district um, to help us um, not only decide what can be cut and reduced from our budget, but also what we need to maintain. What are those high priorities? Where do we wanna make sure we're maintaining in our investments? And particularly for that purpose of what do we want to invest in, the Local Control Accountability Plan or LCAP contains goals and actions that help guide us in our thinking. Um, and the three goals are student achievement, access and equity, and accountability. So with those in mind, we then took a framework um, that we've been referring to as zero-based budgeting, where we look through this lens of thinking about our investments in the form of core services, district priorities, and service enhancements. Um, that those core services are investments that we need to make as a district and a county of office, county office of education to make sure that we're meeting the educational and operating operating requirements um, for our students and school sites. However, to the extent that we have resources available, we might also invest in our district priorities, um, where we equitably allocate resources that support improved academic and social emotional outcomes for our focal students and their families. This is a big area of investment currently in our district, and we've been having the real benefit of uh, local funding sources, such as the Public Education Enrichment Fund to help us um, with this type of work. But then on top of that type of investment, there are service enhancements where you can think about uh, funding that we put in to programs to achieve a higher level of service, um, quicker response times, um, and, and just overall a higher level of service. <laughs> Um, and as you can see, that as you work your way from the core to the service enhancements, um, when we have to make uh, decisions about where to cut from our budget, we would want to make sure that we are preserving those core, core services the most. And then as a final lens, we looked at the proximity to the student. Um, so thinking about direct services, indirect services, operations, and administration. These are all different areas um, of how uh, students are supported, either at their school sites or by central services where um, staff could be deployed from a central office to have, have additional staff um, at a school site to provide support, um, operational support, student uh, nutrition workers in a cafeteria, custodial services. Those are all areas that are Def, um, under the definition of operations, um, but are also very close to our students. And then finally, administration, thinking about everything from business services, human resources, and legal, where those types of investments are critical for our operations, um, but are actually technically farther away from our students. So with those lenses in mind, uh, we looked at our larger budget, and um, you can see that this summarizes our expenditures across the district um, in that framework of site-based budgets uh, to direct services, indirect services, operations, and administration really as a way to help us just organize the different types of expenditures that we carry as a district. Um, however, then we applied the lenses to develop a budget balancing plan uh, where we made proposals for reductions in each of these categories. Um, and as you can see, the proposal um, that has been presented to the Board of Education to date um, highlights a reduction um, in our site-based budget of $50 million, and that's looking at weighted student formula, which is the way that we allocate our funding to school sites based upon the number of students enrolled at a given site, um, as well as the staffing that is allocated to those sites through our multi-tiered system of support. And then for central budgets, 
we looked at each of these areas of direct, indirect operations and administration. And again, tried to apply these various lenses, everything from our LCAP goals to our zero-based budgeting framework of thinking about core priority and enhancement, um, and then all the way to this proximity to our student, trying to look for those opportunities uh, to um, make reductions in areas that will have the least harm on our students and maintain those investments um, in those core essential areas. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Gordon. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Anne Marie Gordon, and I am the Executive Director of Budget Services for the school district. And we're going to take a couple, we're going to go through a couple more slides to start making, making sense of, of all of the details that have been shared so far and to talk a little bit more about the specific impact of this balancing plan on students and schools. So on the next slide, um, we have this, we wanted to take a moment um, to, to share and to kind of, and to orient around equity as a guiding principle in how we allocate money to our schools. And the way that we do that is by ensuring that every school has a base level of funding and staff. And then we use a weighted student formula. Um, our, our weighted student formula helps then allocate additional funds, additional staff to students in schools facing systemic needs. On the next slide, we have a little bit more information about both the weighted student formula or site-based budgeting on the left side of this table where funds are allocated based on student characteristics and budgeted by site leaders in consultation and in partnership with school communities. And there's choice and autonomy in how these funds are used. We also have the multi-tiered system of supports and other centrally managed allocations that are usually in the form of staffing support. And those, um, those are prescribed to school sites or kind of assigned as a set position like a nurse or a social worker or a librarian. Um, and so really as we, as we go through some of the details, what you'll see is that the, the balancing plan includes it, it includes reductions and changes on both sides of this visual, on both sides of the picture. Um, but the goal um, through through the changes, even though right, even though we are proposing reductions, is that we're able to ensure that core and make sure that every school has what they need to right to maintain to serve their students. Um, but recognizing that we have to make adjustments, we have to think about where we can, um, where, where we need to really focus uh, because, because of our structural deficit. Next slide, please. So this slide uh, provides some more information about some of the proposed changes to the weighted student formula. You'll see that we have a number of components or pieces of a school puzzle uh, that are important and necessary to make sure that a school can run, that a school can do everything it needs to do. And we've highlighted a few places where changes are being proposed. Uh, what you'll see is that those changes increase the baseline or they kind of increase that minimum. But what it means is that we'll be able to guarantee that every school can do that minimum, but there will be reductions and changes to doing more than that, um, which is which is definitely right. That's definitely a challenge, and it's and it's we know that that that's that's a hard thing, a hard process to go through. But we want to also make sure that every school that we have that that baseline guarantee for all schools. Part of the change in weighted student formula is also due to 
declines in enrollment. And so that's another important, an important note in the proposal is that just based on fewer students enrolled in SFUSD, we can um, look at, 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 at reducing, for example, the number of classrooms where we have fewer students at a particular school. But the way that a school budget will change will be different site by site um, because of the fact that we do a weighted student formula where allocations are based on school specific characteristics. Next slide, please. So the other, one of the other big pieces and one of the other big impacts is um, a proposed reduction to the multi-tiered system of support. We call it MTSS for short. And what it is, is a set of allocations, um, a set of different positions that are allocated to schools based on a tier, based on a kind of tier one or tier two or tier three. So schools are receive that tier designation and then they get additional supports based on that tier. And it was really envisioned as this, this comprehensive set of positions it's, and it's enhanced the, the non-instructional non staffing. So that's like coaches um, and positions like that that work in schools, which has been really helpful and really, it does, it's something where we, the, the idea is that it helps with um, school, school improvement. Um, but the theory of action and the idea behind it um, we haven't done it consistently at every school and every year. And so it means that we haven't been able to truly do what we envisioned we were going to do when it first started almost 10 years ago. And so the proposal to, to make reductions to MTSS is based on focusing the supports more on what it was originally intended and reducing the overall amount that we spend because we don't have strong evidence of the improved student outcomes that we wanted to see from it. So we're going to focus on, right, we're going to keep, keep kind of narrow the focus, make it more specific so that we can really, really monitor and understand the impact that it's having. Next slide, please. So this slide is one, one way to look at some of the changes and what, what schools are going to see as part of weighted student formula and MTSS. Um, so you can see on the right side under MTSS, we have tier one and tier two and tier three columns to help represent what positions and what supports schools will receive as part of MTSS. When you put together this whole picture, it gives you more, right? It gives you, it gives you a, a more comprehensive, like a better full view of many of the positions that are allocated to school sites or that are included as, that are, that are um, planned for as part of the weighted student formula. To add a little bit more detail to this, on the next slide, we actually have something new that we're really excited to share. Um, and that is a core staffing infographic, a set of infographics for all school levels. And so this one here is an example for elementary schools. We have one for elementary, for K to eight, for middle and for high school, where we have this mix of, right, of it's a, a flower design to show emanating, kind of coming from the core, the different positions that we see at sites that are part of allocations that schools choose um, with some different colors to help categorize and organize the way that everything can appear because it can be a lot to put together when you think about the whole budget. The next slide is also the high school visual. So we wanted to show you a couple. Um, we didn't put them all here, but we'll be sure to be sharing them. Um, 
I think they're going to go on the website so we can provide more information, but wanted to I think we're really excited to have a visual like this to help um, illustrate all the ways that schools are resourced and this includes some of the changes that are proposed in the balancing plan. So the last bit um, is our next steps and I believe that Miyang will be speaking next. That's right. So thank you again, uh, colleagues and, and everybody who is taking the time to be here tonight. We really, really appreciate your, your interest. I see a ton of really rich uh, questions that are, that are being entered into the Q&A box. And uh, in case folks missed the comments at the beginning from our wonderful moderators, uh, we, the next part of the, the discussion after I'm finished is, is gonna focus on trying to get to many of those questions. So before we do that though, we wanted to uh, share a little bit of information about how our community can stay involved. And the, the next slide shows some information about things that are going to happen. We hope good things that will happen after December. Um, so this is the, the hopeful part of the, of the presentation. And I'm glad I get to, to speak to this part. So um, as, as you've already heard, the balancing plan has to be submitted by the district and approved by the, the Board of Education by December 15th. And that's scheduled for December 14th, the board meeting. And uh, after that, there will continue to be updates to our financial projections. And most, uh, we're, we're really anxious to look forward to something that will happen in January, a little less than a month following the the submission of our balancing plan, which is the governor will propose a budget for next year by January 10th, on or by January 10th. And I wanna comment a little bit on that. So uh, there are uh, a number of, of factors that are putting some strain on our budget, which are uh, included in these projections of, of deficits for next year. Um, including this declining enrollment, which we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, and this, this is true for districts uh, across the whole state. And uh, we are not alone. We are pretty much right in line with, with these statewide patterns. And we are joining with a lot of other uh, a lot of other school districts, a lot of statewide education organizations. There's a, a big coalition forming trying to seek uh, additional funding improvements through the local control funding formula uh, to increase the per student funding and also to uh, seek some protections, some, some buffers from this statewide phenomenon of declining enrollment. We're also uh, prioritizing in our advocacy efforts, seeking additional funding for special education. Um, and that, that area has been uh, underfunded by uh, Washington, D.C., the federal government, as well as the state historically. So uh, we're, we're trying to uh, advocate and argue for additional improvements in special education funding and other priorities. Um, and the good news is, this is the hopeful part, um, the state revenues for the, the past several months since the budget was adopted for this year are trending in a positive direction. So uh, when we see the governor's budget proposal in January, we hope, and many, many other folks are hoping that there will be some improvements in the revenue projections for next year or even for this year. Um, but the issue is timing. We don't have that information yet. And uh, in the meantime, we have to submit our balancing plan to the state um, uh, by mid-December. And so beginning in January, the, the official um, budget development process for next year, uh, the typical process, I should say, uh, will, will really continue. 
and uh, needs to be wrapped up by June. And so for, for those of you who have uh, watched and been engaged in, uh, in our typical budget process, the months from January to June uh, will continue to be really important for, for, that, for that important process. The next slide uh, repeats some of the information that Commissioner Lamb, I think, highlighted towards the beginning. So just to, to restate this, uh, again, thank you so much for coming tonight to this town hall. Um, and then tomorrow, the Budget and Business Services Committee will continue the board's discussion of this uh, challenging process. And then next Tuesday, the Board of Education will meet as a committee of the whole. In other words, the full board um, will continue to discuss um, all of this, including uh, the trade-offs and, and uh, really gearing up towards that uh, December 14th meeting where the board will adopt um, the plan to submit to CDE. I do wanna say that one, uh, one development that will be featured tomorrow is a discussion about some really, uh, another piece of really good news that we found out about uh, recently, a couple of weeks ago, is uh, the Proposition G uh, lawsuit that had been uh, held up in court for a few years, challenging the validity of, of a ballot measure that was passed a couple of years ago. Uh, that has now been resolved. And so we will be sharing some recommendations about the impact of, of that, that good news uh, on this balancing plan. And then the very last slide is a, uh, the timeline. This is, this is sort of a typical timeline for uh, the, the development of the uh, district's local control and accountability plan. Um, which is uh, submitted every every June to the state, and uh, also incorporating information about the process for uh, school planning that takes place at each school site. So um, this this first column, I won't go through each each column here. Um, and if you have questions, then please feel free to submit them to the chat. But I did want to remark that um, although this is a typical calendar. Uh, this year that we that we're in now, uh, we did not have um, the first step of this process take place where it says submit revised school budget to SFUSD. So for a number of reasons, we didn't we didn't revise school budgets this this past fall. Um, and so if that sounds unfamiliar to you um, for this this current year, then then that's why um, we didn't we didn't go through that process. So the rest of the information here, as you can see, really starts in January um, and uh, involves the, the planning process at each school site. And in the interest of time, I won't go through uh, all of this information in detail, but um, I'll summarize by just saying that um, the rest of the spring, uh, especially you know, by March and, and, uh, and then leading up to, to June, uh, there are planning processes that take place at each school site and, and uh, certainly at the district level as well. So with that, I'm going to pass back to Michelle or Miranda to transition to our q and I think. Great, thank you so much, Miyong, and um, all of our panelists um, this evening. Um, so as Miyong mentioned, we're gonna spend the remainder of the time trying to answer some of the questions. Uh, that have been submitted via the Q&A and through surveys. Um, and we just wanna do a, a little shout out. I hope folks were able to join tonight um, in, as we were unable to get our Facebook uh, live streaming to, to be resolved. So um, please know that this is being recorded and it will be posted um, hopefully by the end of the week on the district's website. So you'll be able to watch it um, and share it with others who were not able to be here this evening. So we do appreciate folks' patience and um, yeah, we will be providing links um, in the chat as to where you can find that information. Um, and I'm just trying to manage my screen a little bit here. We also want wanted... to uh, jump in and start with one of the questions that's coming. Well, 
actually there was i will in just a second but there was a request if we could introduce um elliot and his role oh, great okay um so i believe is elliot here this evening elliot yeah. duchon there yeah, you good, are good evening Th thank you i've been listening and um, um thank you for inviting me this will be the input that i hear tonight the questions that are asked will be very important to the work that i'm doing in representing the California Department of Education and reporting to them how the district is handling the budget deficit that's in front of them. So, um, you know, I think it's great. I wish I could see all the people signed on, but I certainly want to thank people for taking an interest in this. I think it's very critical because in, in the end, we're all here because we want to provide the best education for children with the resources that the district has. So thank you all for for having me here. Thank you so much, Elliot. Elliot is, um, his role is as the fiscal expert that the state has assigned um, to our district to kind of just help us in this process. So thank you so much, Elliot. Thank you. And Miranda, I will let you take away with the first questions. Um, great, yeah, so I'm really happy. There have been so many great questions and we'll get to as many as we can. We're sort of um, starting with the ones that have been asked by multiple people in the chat or through the survey. Um, and so one, one thing that I think um, a lot of people are asking about is whether and when site consolidations might be considered. Um, and related to that, questions about what it means to consolidate potentially classrooms within schools and whether that would mean split grades potentially or just kind of what that would look like. I can share a little bit. Um, I think what we, we've we actually started looking at this kind of school by school already because we are, right, we are, we are aiming to avoid the split level classes um, what we're doing is we're really looking at where enrollment has declined enough in a particular grade at a particular school where an, a classroom could, right, a classroom could be consolidated and there would still be enough classrooms for the remaining students um, at that same grade. So, right, using a very simple example, if we were, if we had two classrooms that each had 10 students at the same grade. Um, we could merge those classrooms to be one classroom of 20. We would still be within our target class size goals. Um, and we would not be needing to split uh, between grades in one classroom. So every case is not that clear cut and we know that. Um, and so that's really what we're trying to look at closely is to make sure that any any cases where we're looking at classroom consolidations, we understand you know, what we're looking at projected enrollment and really taking carefully into consideration what the impact would be and whether that makes sense for those students. Great. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Um, Michelle, do you want to ask the next, que next question? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. Um... So I think, um, you know, I guess a, bi a big uh, question that folks have is, you know, what are the opportunities um, for community feedback and discussion beyond uh, December? Um, is there, you know, uh, how is there still wriggle room for input uh, or is, is what we submit on the 15th, is that set in stone? And I guess <laughs> uh, I can speak to some of that. Um, and some of that is that um, we are in the process of planning more events. There'll be um, things that are led by the LCAP task force. And this came up in the Q&A, but the um, LCAP is the local control and accountability plan. And I'm going slowly because I'm watching our ASL interpreters and trying to honor them as they support our interpretation this evening. So that basically means that's the plan for the money that the state gives us to support certain particular populations of students. So um, students that are designated as ELL, um, English language learners, 
Uh, we also like to say they, they're, those are students who are learning a language in addition to their home language. Uh, students who are currently receiving services through the foster youth programs and students whose families qualify for the district's free and reduced meal program. So um, through the LCAP, there will be some opportunities. Um, we are also really, really encouraging families to um, become involved, if you're not already, at the school site level. So through the school site council or SSC, um, that's really the group at the school site that makes those decisions um, about, you know, we've got certain set positions that are set, and then you heard that there's some flexibility with some of the money. And those flexible spots, that's where a school site will, a uh, council will make a decision on, are we gonna have this position or that position? Um, and it's where the school sets its plan for how it's gonna support its students in the coming year. So SSC meetings are open to the public, um, to the school community especially. Um, they plan community meetings to get broader school community input. Um, so if you are not aware of when your school's SSC meets, encourage you to reach out to your school principal um, or secretary or other leadership. And, um, and if you uh, don't get information that you're seeking, again, you're always welcome to reach out to the PAC, um, PAC at sfusd.edu. Um, and then we will be announcing additional uh, opportunities for information and engagement um, as we move into the year. We just don't have those dates set yet, so we can't give that out now. Um, and then the other piece to that question was um, maybe Anne-Marie more for you or Megan, which is really around once we have that plan submitted to the state, what kind of wiggle room, if you will, do we have um, in terms of um, making changes to that? Um, I could take a first stab at that. I think um, I just want to reiterate what Myung had shared towards the end of the presentation that we're going to be looking closely at the governor's January budget, um, hoping for some good news there. Um, and to the extent that we do see improved revenue um, that we can assume for our budget, um, then we can modify our balancing plan. Um, and I would say that with this process, we've been following um, an effort to prioritize investments and, and looking for where we need to make cuts. But with good news, we'll need to follow a similar process of, of looking at our priorities closely and restoring um, those programs um, that we um, most highly prioritize. Um, and so I, I think that in that way, we're going to need to continue, um, maybe not as, an, as intensive of a process as we've been having over these past couple, couple of months where every budget and business services committee meeting and committee of the whole is focused on the budget. Um, but we will definitely need to have, um, I anticipate um, at least um, updates at the budget and business services committee meetings to keep the board and the public um, apprised of any changes um, in our revenue forecast, um, because we'll want to continue to modify that balancing plan accordingly, all the way up through to budget approval. Great, thank you so much, Miranda. Yes. Um, so I'm trying to think of how to com combine a bunch of questions that have come in around the same theme. And it's really a question we've been hearing from the beginning, which is kind of, how did we get here? But more specifically, people have been asking about um, how have expense, why have expenses been growing so quickly? Um, why were they increasing last year, even when schools were closed? And why does the yellow line on the slide climb dramatically next year? What are the new additional costs that we're expecting or projecting for next year? Um, and I think this also goes to sort of just questions that have come in about the structural nature, what it means that this is a structural deficit and how the solutions that are being proposed are structural solutions. Um, maybe to speak to the first part of why are our expenditures growing so quickly and what does it mean? Why is that yellow line drop down and then jump back up? Um, the cost of 
operating a school district in San Francisco and probably across the state, but we know the costs are high in San Francisco for one. Uh, you know, everything from, uh, you know, personnel and uh, to utilities, to, um, you know, transportation costs, other contracts that we need to enter into to provide the services, services and supports to our students. Um, those do grow year over year. Um, and um, our bar budget is comprised of approximately 80% in personnel costs. Um, and as anybody who is familiar with um, the cost of health benefits, looking at pension, retirement costs, um, those elements of personnel expenditures grow at very fast rates. Um, and that's uh, just something that we need to adapt to. We don't have a lot of choice uh, with regard to controlling those costs, um, aside from finding ways um, to cut back and, and manage our overall expenditures uh, within our budget. And, um, you know, so that helps explain why the trajectory is so steep, uh, steep why costs have grown so quickly. Um, keep in mind that in that chart, it drops down because it's reflecting a shift of unrestricted general fund costs onto federal stimulus and one-time state dollars. Um, and when it jumps back up, you might see that there's actually, if you didn't account for the dip, it, it's actually a pretty steady climb. Um, the trajectory is um, pretty consistent year over year. And so what you're really seeing is the restoration of those expenses, moving those back onto the unrestricted general fund, and then accounting for that ongoing growth, uh, particularly um, in personnel costs, specifically in uh, health and pension um, are some of the biggest drivers um, of the of those expenses. Can I add to to that what Megan just shared? Uh, also, uh, want to just share that prior to the to the pandemic, we we were aware of uh, a structural deficit, uh, but it was it was quite a bit smaller than than it is now. Um, projected to be. And during the pandemic, there were, this is very double-edged and, and we have been very happy about this, uh, but there were uh, one-time protections that were provided by the state and by the federal government, whether through uh, protecting districts from uh, dips from decreases in enrollment or attendance during uh, the, the two years of the pandemic, two school years of the pandemic, and then this, the additional one-time relief funds that Megan and, and others have mentioned. And those are really important to allow us to uh, uh, maintain stability and not have really disruptive, chaotic, uh, uh, budget challenges to contend with at the same time we were looking out for our our students and families health our staff's health and and uh, as everyone here knows how difficult the last couple of years have have been and so we really um, were grateful for and relied on those funds and the the uh, difficult part of that is it in the meantime the ongoing uh, gap between revenues and expenses was still there and it kind of continued to grow for a couple more years. And so um, we, we have been aware that, that the time was, was approaching where we, we would need to bring those into balance and then to top it off, uh, seeing the significant um, reduction in enrollment that we mentioned earlier, that expanded the size of the problem. Um, and again, we are trying to advocate for uh, protections through additional funding to, to offset the, the effects of, of those, increase, those decreases in enrollment. But in the meantime, with the projections that we're working with, um, that has been another uh, sort of a double whammy um, on top of an exist, a pre-existing structural deficit. And 
just to follow up on sort of the other part of this question that I've been he hearing from a few people is how are, is the proposed balancing plan addressing the structural issues? Are these changes going to be ongoing in the way that funding works or how is this going to in the future keep us from having this problem? Um, so the balancing plan includes $90 million worth of proposed expenditure reductions and $35 million of additional funding sources. Um, and um, the expenditure reductions are anticipated to be ongoing. Um, the revenue sources are not all on, ongoing. Um, there is a significant portion of fund balance that we're proposing to use. Um, over the course of the two fiscal years. Um, my justification for that was is that um, I personally have been actively pushing to develop those reserves to help stabilize us over these years. So um, unlike um, you know, just spending down available reserves that we happen to have, um, those, the development of those reserves really has been intentional. Um, but unfortunately they are one time, um, and so those can't can't be counted beyond the two years within this balancing plan. Um, so um, I think the reality of it is that the majority of the plan is intended to be ongoing and will address our structural deficit. Um, but beyond that, our work will have to continue. Um, that um, in those following years, we're going to need to identify. Um, additional ongoing ways um, to address those deficits. Of course, our hope is that the state will be part of that solution, um, that we may be able to um, replace that fund balance on the sources side of this balancing plan with improved ongoing revenue. The challenge, of course, will that ongoing revenue continue to grow? Will it eventually outpace our growth in expenditures? Probably not knowing um, the history of, of how we've had to balance. So um, all the more reason for us to develop these muscles, build these processes and this type of community engagement, because um, unfortunately I anticipate this is going to be ongoing work. And I see Commissioner Lamb has a hand up as well. Yes, I just wanted to chime in that the, and part of also the California Department of Education and having Elliot and his team be part of this process is that we've reached as a school district to a particular point um, where we have been given notice essentially that we have had, you know, as Megan, you know, spoke to tonight, m you know, many years of de declining student enrollment over about five, five years of that while those expenses um, and relying on one time sources. So there is criteria of how we're you can name it as being quote graded um, by the California Department of Education of how we're doing long term, long term what I what we call you know, fiscal sustainability and you know certainly Elliot I welcome you to chime in too um, I, I think there was also a question around like um, you know do you have recommendations or what is um, the role of you and your team in the coming weeks and coming months um, so that we can ensure that that SF Unified is on a very clear path um, to that financial stability. And for me, and, and as the budget chair of the Board of Education, the sustainability, really, truly, how are we matching ourselves up um, to, uh, as a school district um, and with the financial revenue that we are um, you know, bringing in and serving our students. And Commissioner Lamb, I think you actually answered it uh, better than I could, but I, I will say that the state's um, issue was that in certain quarters of the following three years, districts have to show that they can meet their obligations. Um, uh, you know, unlike a household or most other governmental agencies, districts submit to the state what's called a multi-year projection which has to have a lot of backup information. And it basically says that the revenue and expenditures match to the degree that the district can meet its obligations. And that did not happen over the course of the next three years. And, and I do want to address a little bit the issue of change because it's come up in a couple of ways. Uh, the state certainly expects that as new information comes along, 
that the district has to change. For example, you go through the governor's budget process, you'll have the governor's budget in January, the governor's revised in May, and you may not ultimately know what the true budget is until after the school year has started. I mean, so you're supposed to know, but it doesn't always work that way. Although the legislature has been pretty good about that. So it is a process that has flexibility and input. In fact, at, at your June meeting where you approve your LCAP, there's also public impact input on the, both the LCAP and the budget. So it's a process that continues. And the bottom line for the state is over time, given the revenue that you get per student, and as in terms of San Francisco, there are some additional revenues that are committed to the district for various reasons, um, for salary enhancements, for arts and PE and other things that have been approved generously by your voters. But they have to balance too, even though there are other sources. And I, I think that the recommend, well, I know the recommendations that will come to from me specifically is that whatever the board acts on, it's got to show in the next three years that the district can meet its obligations and is not using one-time resources and has adequate reserves. Um, the state also becomes concerned when your reserves drop below the, the state level. And you have slightly lower, it's I think 2% for a larger district. Um, other districts have 3%, um, but you also have a rainy day fund because you have some other volatility. And I think it's come up and you're all aware of that. San Francisco is an expensive place to live. There's infrastructure issues in the school. Um, I will say that I have been very impressed with the commission and the staff and the seriousness with which they are approaching this issue and the intent to do everything in the right way. Um, it may look, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this publicly, worse in January than it might in May or June. Um, hopefully it doesn't get worse the other way around, um, but things change fiscally. The state's fiscal health is also very volatile and you know, we watch it every day, it goes up and down right now, there's an excess. So as really the representative of the California Department of Education, my job is to assure them that what the district produces in the plan and its multi-year projections, what's called its interim report, show fiscal stability for the next three years. I hope that answers it. That was a longer way. I think your answer was better, Commissioner. Thank you both so much. Um, really appreciate everybody's responses um, and chiming in. Um, and I am going to mix it up a little bit now. We've had some questions come in around um, issues of equity. And so both um, thinking about, um, you know, it, uh, at first glance, it might appear that the proposal means that money is actually going to be reduced at the schools that are considered to be most in need. Um, and I know there's factors taken into consideration um, for that. And then also like, how are we considering equity when we're looking at resourcing sites and allocating staff um, when some of our sites have more capacity or maybe higher levels of enrollment? Um, I can start. I was actually trying to type a response to one of those questions and couldn't quite figure out what to say. So, um, I think that in, I would say that in particular, the, the proposed reductions to the multi-tiered systems of support does mean that there are cases where balancing plan does impact schools that, right? And there were also some questions about um, tier one versus tier two versus tier three. And so just to, to very briefly explain, um, our, our research planning and assessment division does an analysis of all of our schools looking at input characteristics. So th there's a number of different things that they look at that um, we see and that through research we see as indicators of, um, indicators of, of higher need. And then the tiers are assigned um, based on the higher a school ranks looking at that analysis. So a tier one school 
um, is seen as having relatively less of that kind of input data need compared to tier two and tier three. So reductions to allocations at tier three sites does mean that it's, it's, it, it's, it is a cut in some of those services um, at schools that we have right through that analysis seen as indicating higher need. Um, however, what we are really trying to focus on, I know I, I don't want to diminish that at all. I don't want to say that and then try to brush it aside. Um, I think that it's important, um, but I also think that part of the reason that this is in the proposal is because we haven't, we haven't seen a really strong connection between those supports and higher student outcomes over time. And so that's really, it isn't that support for our students isn't important, but we really wanna focus on the supports where we're seeing impact and where we feel that our communities, our school communities have autonomy and the ability to make decisions that they feel and can really believe are most linked to their student success. And so that's, I think that's a big piece of wanting to bolster right to strengthen the baseline in weighted student formula because even though we have a set of positions right a set of supports that are in that baseline schools have choice schools and school communities have choice over what positions those actually are and so if something else would be a better configuration that can happen through weighted student formula and so I think all of that to say, realistically, what we are gonna see is that across many of our schools, across the really the diverse portfolio of schools that we have, we are gonna see reductions and we are gonna see changes. And it's gonna, and it is gonna be hard. Um, it's gonna be, there are gonna be difficult decisions through the process, but what we are trying to do in this proposal is focus our resources and really preserve the areas where where that where we can see kind of our values lived um, in a way that we think will most resonate with with schools and school communities. I also wanted to chime in, um, you know, thank you, Anne Marie. As we opened up tonight's town hall, is to acknowledge just how difficult of a financial. Um, position the school district is in. And at the same time, I also want to name that the Board of Education, along with the superintendent and our, our um, school district leadership, has also been intentional about making in, um, certain and continue to make certain investments. So, for example, that we applied um, our both federal and state recovery dollars from COVID, knowing how important it was to have stability. When our students came back, came back to in-person after being away for um, 18 months of in-person learning, we wanted to make sure that there wasn't any large shifts in what, as we came back, knowing that um, the education recovery, the, the um, mental health and social emotional um, supports for our students were first and foremost. Um, in addition, um, the Board of Education over the past several years uh, before COVID as well, also made certain decisions so that, for example, um, in the fall, when there would be after what we call the 10 day, um, you know, student count of shifts of enrollment, we also made a decision uh, to, to not have those um, schools that saw transfer of students or loss of student enrollment that we would what we called hold harmless. So I, I just wanted to be able to demonstrate and name that, you know, the board has also, um, you know, made intentional decisions uh, to try to stabilize school budgets. And now we're at the point where Elliot and the California Department of Education is saying, we can no longer continue in this uns unsustainable way fiscally. Um, and I, I think that there was a follow-up also in the questions related to the same kind of topic, um, which is more about how, um, how are these decisions being made? Like what data is being looked at to determine whether a program is effective or a MTSS support is effective 
or if it's not. Um, and is that data available for people to see or how is how are those determinations being made? That's a great question. Um, and I would say that it is because it is such a because there is such a range of programs and services and investments, it means that the right the decisions for each one have been kind of unique to each program um i know and what i would also share is i don't remember if we included some of the links to previous presentations but i do know that in in some of those presentations and i know there's also a question about um I think, for example, some questions about multilingual pathways or or um, AVID. So it's it's recommendations that are coming from different parts of the balancing plan. Um, but one, I think, for the direct services in particular, um, we did try to go through the list of the different allocations that we're proposing reductions to um, to provide at least a little bit of background. I know it isn't it isn't a lot, but it's some um, kind of program by program what the recommendation is or what the conclusions or observations were. So I think maybe that's a good starting point um, to at least get a little bit more into the details of each of the different cases. I appreciate that. And I do remember seeing some of those at the various budget meetings. And I just posted a link um, to the SFUSD website where I think we can access all of those uh, slide decks from prior meetings if folks are interested in looking at those. Um, so the next question that I wanted to ask that has, I know it was touched on a little bit in the presentation, but everybody wants to know about Prop G funds. And, um, you know, I guess specifically, I think there's, questions about, you know, is this a one-time fund? Are there going to be ongoing Prop G funds? Um, is it going to be an ongoing contributor to covering salaries? And so I think maybe explaining sort of, uh, yeah, what's going to be happening with those funds and then the relationship between those and the Prop J funds and kind of how, how that will play out. I can, I can uh, comment on that a bit um, to get things started. So it's a little complicated, but I'll try to summarize by saying um, Prop G originally passed in 2018, covered a period of 20 years. And uh, because of this litigation, there were three years of, of revenues that were collected by the city, um, but uh, kept uh, kept in an like an escrow account, you know, collected but not released. Um, and because of that litigation, the the mayor Breed and a lot of other folks supporters, including many of us here, um, uh, put uh, another replacement ballot measure on the ballot um, in 2020. And that covered years four through 20 of Prop G. And that was called Proposition J. And that passed, that measure passed. And so Proposition J starts in the year that we're in now, fiscal year 2021 to 2022, and goes for another 16 years. And so from this year forward, uh, the, the, the tax for Prop J is a little bit smaller, but basically stabilized the ongoing revenue um, that was originally intended to be funded by Prop G. So that, that was a big relief to all of us um, that we could have those revenues continue in, in this year and beyond. And then just under two weeks ago, there was a, a final resolution of the court case um, that was originally that was in the courts for uh, almost three years, actually more than three years, um, and uh, that was a, a good outcome for for the district. Um, 
and the, the tax was upheld, the validity of the tax was upheld, which basically means those three years of revenue collections are, are now on track to be released uh, to, to the district. And uh, as I believe, as Megan mentioned, uh, maybe I mentioned it, <laughs> um, we are going to share some of our, our staff recommendations about uh, about those uh, now on not not quite unlocked, but soon to be unlocked funds, um, and how uh, how they uh, should be distributed with the uh, budget committee tomorrow, and uh, that will also fold into the next couple of of um, meetings of the full board on December seventh and December fourteenth. Mian, could you provide a, just a quick snapshot about between Prop G and J, what um, they essentially, um, the ballot initiative, what did it cover? And does that, um, you know, I, I, those funds, are they accounted for um, built into our, our already of uh, expenses? Sure, yes, thanks, Commissioner. So um, the, the largest, uh, the thrust, the biggest uh, theme for both measures was to improve our compensation for our educators and, and other um, employees. And uh, that, that was most of the funds for Prop G and for Prop J. So that allowed us to, to um, boost our salaries for our educators. Um, starting in 2018-19. And uh, because of some alternate funding that was identified um, for those three years, we were able to, to start those improvements and continue them. And now with Prop J, they can, they can continue going forward. Um, in terms of whether they're incorporated, yes, Prop J dollars are uh, included in our uh, financial projections. So the, the expenses and the revenues are, are included and um, we're, we're relieved about that and, and we're delighted about the, the uh, favorable resolution of, of the lawsuit. Um, the, the unlocked funds from the three years of Prop G, um, th again, that will be discussed um, beginning at the Budget and Business Services Committee tomorrow. So none of the numbers that have been shared tonight uh, include the effect of, of that favorable outcome in the, in the litigation yet, but that's about to, to be incorporated um, very shortly. Great, thank you so much. I think that was really helpful and it gives us something positive to look forward to. So um, we're gonna take just one more uh, question and it's just this simple when will school sites know kind of what they're going to be working with um great questions tonight um so our our typical timeline uh i think our typical timeline is that we share budget allocations with school sites um, in the first couple weeks of February. Um, this, I think this year that gives us time, right, to finalize and hopefully have an approved plan in December, um, you know, start working through some of those details, but also wait until the governor's budget in the middle of January to get, right, kind of that's our, our last opportunity for updates before we finalize all of the allocations, um, right? That's that's the most information that we get um, before we before we start the process. So I think, as as far as any of us have planned, we'll 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 have a similar process this year where we'll share that information the first few weeks of February, and then um, normally budgets are due back uh, right before spring break. So it's most of the month of February, and then and then into March that the budget planning and school site planning process is really, really in high gear. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, that was really helpful with the timeline, um, kind of letting us know when we can expect things. So um, thank you. Well, we know there's always 
more questions that are going to come up. Um, so we encourage everyone to stay involved in this process. Um, respond to and share the survey. Um, Miranda's dropped that information into the chat again. Um, and um, stay tuned to the district website. We will get materials translated and posted um, as soon as we possibly can. Um, and as Deputy Superintendent um, Lee and others mentioned, we have these upcoming meetings. Um, so we have the um, Budget and Business Services Committee meeting tomorrow at four. Uh, and then the upcoming Board of Education meetings on both December 7th and December 14th. And um, meetings are both live streamed and recorded. So if you have a chance to watch live, you can, and if not, you can watch it later. And those links and then later those recordings um, are posted at sfusd.edu slash board, B-O-A-R-D dash education. Um, great, yes. Miranda? Yeah, I just wanted to end by thanking everybody who attended tonight. Um, really pleased that there are so many people who are interested in following and engaging in this process. Um, and I wanna also thank everybody who was a part of making this happen. Um, our panelists, our interpreters, all of the folks behind the scenes, including Kate Moore from PPS, who's been uh, working behind the scenes and also especially Hong Mei Peng, who's SFUSD's Director of Communications and has really been instrumental in making this happen and getting the word out. So thank you everybody um, and good night. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining us, Elliot. And thank you everybody who tuned in. Um, this is a team effort, so thanks to everybody. Thank you, good evening. Thank you.